Hello and welcome to the Book Tasters from Young Adult and Tween and everything in between. The Book Tasters serve up the tastiest reviews of today's and yesterday's greatest stories. I'm your host, Timothy J. Burdick, and I'm joined today by my co-host for the day, Mr. Devin. Devin, how you doing, man? Good, how are you? I'm doing great. It's nice of you to be here. Oh yeah, it's fun. I'm excited. Mm-hmm. So you came and you had a couple of facts ready for us today, right? Yeah. Why don't you give us a start off? What are some interesting facts that we should know about? Uh, did you know that on August 17, 1957, a lady attending a Philadelphia Phillies game was struck by two foul balls in a row on two consecutive pitches? On two consecutive pitches? Yeah. That lady should have gotten a lottery ticket and definitely <laughs> should have stayed out of a storm because if she would have gotten struck by lightning two times consecutively, she probably wouldn't visit any more baseball games, would yeah. she? <laughs> now, are you a baseball fan? Yeah, so I what, love playing. what position do you play? I play every position, center field, third base. I pitch sometimes. Nice. I can do it Ever. Now, have you gotten hit consecutively twice on the field by two foul balls? No. What about two straight enough. balls, like right to the face, same thing or anything? Um, no. Okay, good. Really, yeah. I got hit in the face when I was in Little League, and I only played one year of Little League for that reason. I did not want to get hit in the face again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go on to fact number two. This one I got, all right? Uh, did you know that the Eiffel Tower can be 15 centimeters taller in the summer? Wow. Why do you think that is? I have no clue. Do you think it eats its vegetables and drinks its milk? (laughs) (laughs) A lot of it. (laughs) No, I think it might have something to do with the expansion of the material that it's made of. So if it's really cold, a lot of times things get really kind of like, when you get cold, what do you do? You usually get kind of close and shiver yourself, right? You get a little more compact. But when you, you know, it's summertime, you usually get a little bit wider and bigger and stronger and taller. I bet you, you get about 15 centimeters taller every summer too. (laughs) Yeah, that would... (laughs) Be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, got another one for me? Um, yeah. Did you know that in 30 BC, turkeys were treated like gods? Whoa, so like a turkey god? Yeah. Interesting. So, like, would Thanksgiving then be the biggest day of the year for them? Yeah, probably. I well, assume. Well, then they'd have to kill their own gods. Wow, that yeah. would be. Hmm. Something to think about. I don't yeah. know if I'd want to kill my own god, right? Because then it'd be like, <laughs> okay, oh god, turkey, you are the one I adore. But then all of a sudden it's time for me to eat you. <laughs> yeah, that would be... <laughs> a travesty, right? Yeah. Well, it's a good thing that we conquered that god and now we're actually eating him because I, for one, love Thanksgiving. What's your yeah. favorite thing to eat at Thanksgiving? Oh, I, I love turkey. That's awesome. And I like my grandma makes this jello. It's super tasty. I like that a nice. lot. Nice. Now, does your grandma make the Jello with actual fruit inside the Jello, or is yeah? It, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. yummy. I it's, like that stuff too. Yeah. Sweet. All right, I got another one for you. In a room of twenty-three people, two of them may share the same birthday. In fact, there is a fifty-fifty chance of that happening. Wow. That is crazy. Yeah, math is so weird. I, I, I know. I, sometimes the mystery of numbers and the things that come out of numbers are really quite astonishing to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wish I knew more about math um, to be able to you know, talk a little bit more about it, but unfortunately I'm just a language teacher, so <laughs> all I can do is fill it with words. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you have one more fact for me. Uh, did you know that in a room... Oh, my bad, sorry. Did you know human... Cloning might be possible. Human cloning might be possible. Yeah. Okay, what would a world of human clones look like? It, it's kind of like thinking that um, they're almost exactly like people, almost, but they're being controlled sometimes by, like, remote control almost, a robot. Okay. Almost like that, yeah. So a human clone slash robot would be operated by whoever created the human clone slash robot. Yeah, Hmm, I don't know if I'd like that. I know. It's kind of hard. I don't know if I could handle a different robot me walking around the street doing things that I wouldn't do. Yeah. Unless they got hit by two consecutive foul balls. That would be pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, tell me about that particular fact. How does that deal with the book that you're reading, Masterminds? My book is uh, related to that subject. It talks about um, a lot about... um, nature vs nurture and just that idea and that the kids i don't want to give away the whole thing but 
it's a really important fact in my book. Okay. So can you kind of ask, I want to ask you another question. What does nature versus nurture mean? It means almost uh, nature is um, how you act, um, who you're born from, who's your DNA DNA from. And nurture is uh, the people that you're put around. So yeah. it's the differences between how you act, right, based yeah. on who you are as a person yeah. and also um, how you re- interact with the people in the communities around you and how they have kind of a say in who you are. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense. I grew up in a family of athletes, and so I always played sports like you. Oh, yeah. And um, one of the biggest sports that my family played was basketball, and so I was constantly around basketball. Thankfully, my nature was I was born tall, yeah. and I was pretty athletic. So it actually worked out well for my nurture because I was able to play basketball just like my older brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Masterminds. Um, it's by Gordon Corman, right? Yeah. Masterminds, uh, Criminal Destiny. Gordon Corman is one of my favorite authors. Can you tell me a little bit why you like this book? Oh, because I read number one is a big reason, and it had a lot of, it left you on cliffhangers, and I like those books, because it makes you want to keep reading, and I feel like that's really important to have and as a writer, and yeah, I like Gordon Corman a lot. Nice, cool. Yeah. So give me a brief synopsis. What's going on? Actually, I should ask you, um, how far along are you in this book? About a little over halfway. Okay, that's a perfect point. So you don't know what's going to happen in the end, but yeah. you can kind of have an idea. Why don't you give us a quick, a quick uh, synopsis of what's been going on in your book thus far? Oh, um, so they have, they're just running around um, everywhere because um, these, um, these people from their old community are ch- um, chasing them, and yeah, they just returned to their home, so... Who are they? Who are your main characters in this book? Amber. Eli's the main character, Eli Frieden, and Tori, Amber, and Malik. And do you want me to tell a little about their personalities? Yes, please do. I would love that. Okay. So Malik is the one that they all say fits to the outside world the best because he... He's kind of like one of those poker players. He, so he's rough, he'll pick fights, and yeah, he's just a good person to have if it comes to that opportunity. Yeah, and Eli is like the computer genius. He looks up everything, looks up the best ways, and that's really him. Amber's kind of the one that uh, likes dresses, has a goal weight. She's always makes lists on what she's doing, and that's really her personality. Tori loves art, and that's really important to Tori. And he actually just returned to her art studio. Nice. So we have an artist, we have an organizer, we have a computer genius, and we have kind of a rough-and-tumble type where I've got, right? Yeah. Perfect setup for characters. Now, Mm -hmm. what do these characters do? Would you you mind kind of giving us a a brief synopsis of what happened in the first book, Masterminds, how they were able to do the things they did that led them up to the point that they're at in this book? Um, Well, I don't want to give it all away because there's a big spoiler that I could give, and I don't want to do that. We thank you for that (laughs) in Book Tasters. So give us as much as you can without giving it away. Uh, Well, they discovered some things that had something to do with them and what they learned about their parents. And that brings us to kind of nature vs. nurture again. And they discovered that in a factory that no one's allowed to enter. So, yeah, that's a big, big point in that book. So what is the main problem of this book that needs to get resolved? They're, they escape. Oh, um, they try really hard um, to handle all of that um stuff that they're learning and the real problem is just keeping their information that they're learning away from their parents oh okay so they have to keep a secret behind their parents backs which is pretty hard because they're their parents right Mm -hmm. and they're always around okay if you can give like a little bit of a a taste test of why somebody would want to read this book what is it that they would uh jump on what's the key information that you would tell them like you need to read this book because how would you complete that sentence because um it just 
is exciting to read. My um, heart sometimes is racing while I read this book because I want to learn what happens next. And like I said earlier, that they leave you on spoilers and cliffhangers at the end of chapters and that it just has this mystery slash action adventure and, and it's full of things that you wouldn't expect. Nice. So um, you, we obviously can't spoil the whole book because you haven't read the whole thing yet. Yeah. But up until this point, what's the key piece that people that that kind of keeps you reading besides the fact that it's building up tension, that it's really interesting and it's really exciting and your heart's beating? Um, what's the main issue going on here? What's the what's the, why are the kids trying to hide something from their parents? Because they um, they're just um, they don't want their parents to find out because their parents have tools that can help erase them and they don't want to live their life um when they're not really living it and they just want to be normal kids and that's really their big point of the book that they want to be um normal and they can't do that when um they're in a um that environment Mm -hmm. where it's almost like they use a cage a lab for um the parents I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of secrets. There's a lot of protection. There's a lot of misinformation, perhaps, too. Yeah. And they're trying to discover. So it's kind of a mystery as well, right? Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, let's see here. You said you you brought a couple of you brought the book with you. First of all, yeah. thank you for that. Um, let's give a free sample to our audience and see uh, what's going on in your book thus far. You chose a couple pages to read, right? So why yeah. don't you go ahead and open that. Uh, um, well, I continue to talk a little bit about Gordon Corman. Um, if you didn't know much about Gordon Corman, he actually wrote his first book when he was, I think, 13 or 14 years old. And it got uh, published by Scholastic when he was very young. It was a project that he took on when he was in seventh grade. And so he's been a published author for a very long time, ever since he was pretty close to your age, which is yeah. really cool when you think about how talented you must be to be able to write a book yeah. when you're that young, right? Yeah. Well, let's figure out um, what's going on in Masterminds. Go Uh, for it. The sight of the police car driving away with Amber is one of the most awful things I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of awful things lately. Malik is pacing on the sidewalk in front of Bites and Bites. We begged her not to do anything stupid. And what does she do? Something stupid. You can't blame her, I defend my best friend. None of us understand how things work in the outside world, which is why it makes sense not to do anything, Malik insists. But that's not good enough for Alaska. She knows better. Eli takes off down the block in a futile attempt to keep up with the car. His desperation triggers the same response in Malik and me. If we lose track of Amber in this huge city, we'll never lay eyes on her again. It's all my fault. Amber was my best friend. I should have been keeping a closer eye on her. She took the news about Project Osiris harder than any of us. Why why didn't I know that if she believed she had a solution, fix for our solution, she'd jump into it without thinking. We we can still see the squad car, but it gets harder to spot as it pulls away and traffic fills the street behind it. To m- make matters worse, the sidewalk so the sidewalks are crowded and we're scrambling around an obstacle course of pedestrians and dogs and mailboxes and fire hydrants. Malik gets stuck behind two guys carrying a couch and loses ground. I avoid them dance around the garbage can and catch up to Eli. We lost her, he pants. Not me, I've trained myself to notice details other people miss. Back when I thought my future would be a artist, not a fugitive. The police car is distant, but I've got it in my sight. It's sandwiched between an SUV and a city bus. Lacking the breath for verbal answer, I point. We're just about to blast through the next intercession when intersection when a big semi lumbers right out in front of us. Eli and I practically run onto it, into it, but manage to pull up mere inches from the trailer's vast paneled side. We have no choice. We have, we, 
We st stand flat-footed, waiting for it to inch into the main road. Wow, that is definitely getting my heart pitter-pattering. That's a fantastic <laughs> piece you chose. Now, why did you choose that particular piece? Because I feel like it shows a little of, like, you saw Malik and Amber, their traits. And, and it gives us a little of how much spoilers they leave us in and that you want to keep reading. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I actually want to go to the library and actually take that <laughs> book out right now and just continue right where you're at. I don't even need the beginning. I just need to figure out what's going to happen at that, at that, at that piece, right? If they're going to catch the police officer, yeah. the truck car and everything. Wow, that's an amazing piece. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, Devin, um, thanks for stopping by and talking to us about your book, Masterminds by Gordon Corman. Um, would you say you would highly recommend that book? Yes, it's one of the best I've ever read. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Book Tasters. I am your host, Timothy J. Burdick, and you can find us at thebooktasters.com. That's T-H-E-B-O-O-K. I think I added an extra little there. B-O-O-K. A-S-T-E-R-S dot com and there you'll find our social media links uh, we are on YouTube we're also on all your podcast players that you can think of um, and you can also catch me on uh, Twitter and of course on Instagram at Timothy J. Burdick uh, thank you again Devin for, for stopping by we really appreciate your interpretation of the Masterminds thank you for sharing that book with us it is definitely something that you need to get out and grab today <laughs>